Are we live? Yeah, we are live now. Greetings, everybody. We hope that uh, everybody's been safe, and I hope that you're well, and that at this time in your life that you have the supplies that you need because there's a lot going on in the world right now. And as a Masonic brother, as one who's concerned, one who wants everybody to take care of themselves and their family, I'm sending blessings uh, towards your way and definitely going to keep you in my prayer. So tonight we have back on uh, Brother Manuel Fernando uh, Nunes. And I hope I didn't mess his name up too much. And we're going to get right into this subject tonight <laughs> in regards to the history of the primitive rites. I think that he's one of those ancient primitive rites. This is what we're talking about tonight. And... Yeah, they, they, according to Ricardo Polo, there is a primitive rite that was born in the 1500s. That's a previous rite. That this is this is one of those secular rites of Europe that was then transferred over to Latin America. And we're not going to go into that tonight. I mean, we can talk about that another time. But mm -hmm. I do have the document that I can send to you. But this is from Ricardo Polo, who was a very, very well-respected Freemason in Latin America. Definitely from the progressive, the other stream of Freemasonry, not the regular Anglo-American Freemasonry, but definitely from the other stream, very secular, an agnostic, not a Gnostic, an agnostic, meaning like atheistic mm -hmm. Freemason, who did not want any kind of dogmatic attachment of like, oh, well, you have to believe in God in the afterlife, you know, like in regular Freemasonry, right. totally opposed to it, okay? So I want to make that clear that uh, this this brother was definitely a legit Freemason, and yet, oh, gasp, he didn't necessarily believe in the so-called grand architect of the universe or the sovereign architect of the world. Now there is also discussion as to how these two are different. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Wait, Wait a minute, you need to repeat that. that. You need, repeat that? There's a discussion on what? Oh. Oh, there is, um, according to Robert M. Boleyn, he made the point, that he, he stated that the reason that we have a difference in terms between the grand architect of the universe and the sovereign architect of the worlds, you know how in the ancient and primitive right, we talk about the sovereign architect of the world, or the sublime architect of the worlds, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Different terms than just grand architect of the universe is because the grand architect of the universe is the demiorgos, the demiurge, the, the devil that has formed the world. And the sovereign architect or the sublime architect of the worlds, you know, the S A O T W, I guess, uh -huh. in, uh, in English, the sovereign architect of the world is the creator, Hashem. Oh, Allah really? Allah, you know, yes, so, yes. so, hold on, hold on. I, 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 need, I need for you to rewind oh, for me. I, I got a couple of questions. I need for you to... Oh, this is one just, they don't like to talk about. This I, I, is one they don't like to talk about. I, I need for you to rewind because you said you threw you threw some curves oh. in there and a couple of fastballs. Let me see. I got some lipstick on. I will, uh, I will turn wife. you on to the book where I got that from. No, okay. no, time out. Time out. You, 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 oh, you, you oh. going. I just need to back you up just for a second. You mentioned a couple of things. So let me understand this correctly. You mentioned in regards to the worlds, God of the worlds, meaning more than one. And then you said something in regards to the grand architect of the universe. So okay. if you don't mind, could you slow it down just for a second and talk about the grand architect of the universe? Then we're going to go into the, uh, the, the, the use of the word world. Okay, so the sovereign architect of the worlds. Okay. Is he, definitely Robert. M, this is this is from Robert Amber Lenz. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and this is from a very gnostic perspective. You know, in the gnosis, there is the idea of God creating the universes mm -hmm. as they should be. And then the Demiorgos, which is seen somewhat as a satanic figure, creating this present universe. Okay. And this also ties into 
to some preachers talking about how Satan is the Lord of the world as it is today, blah, 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 mm-hmm. all that, right? Um, I mean, ultimately, whatever symbolism works for you and makes you a better person, that's the right religion for you, okay? Okay. Uh, I, I will go in and say that from the get-go. But if you want to talk about Gnostic interpretations, not agnostic, Gnostic like the Gnosis, you know, like the sacred Gnosis. If you want to talk about Gnostic interpretations, Mm -hmm. the Gnostic interpretation in esoteric Freemasonry, because esoteric Freemasonry is very closely tied into the Gnosis, okay, it's this idea that the sovereign architect of the worlds is a different figure from the grand architect of the universe. Okay. So the sovereign architect of the worlds would be God creator. Okay. The grand architect of the universe would be uh, Satan, the devil, who's in charge of this universe. Oh, okay. oh, wait a minute. Time out. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I just want to rewind. Every time I hear something, I need for you. So you're saying that when, when, when you hear the grand architect of the... I don't want to make this controversial now. Uh, no, no, no. We good. Trust me. We good. So when I hear you when I hear you speak, you said that the grand architect of the universe that would be uh, what we would call Lucifer or Satan per se. Lucifer is seen in a different understanding. Now I, I have here's the other thing, okay? Lucifer, let's put that aside. Let, I don't even want to use that term because in in terms of the gnosis, uh-huh. to a certain degree. Those of us who are Gnostically inclined, like myself included, are Luciferians to a certain degree. In the sense that, hold up now, hold up now, everybody ease down. In the sense that Lucifer, the original meaning is the bringer of light. You, okay. You got, I got that. The, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you now. I'm with you. We driving. Okay, we driving. So, so the idea of Lucifer in a Gnostic sense mm-hmm. is not the idea of Lucifer as Satan. Lucifer is a totally different thing altogether in okay. Gnostic ideology. Okay, it's a gotcha. Totally different thing. Let's say it again. Lucifer in the Gnostic ideology is a totally different thing. Lucifer is this idea, this personification, if you will, of the force of enlightenment. Okay. That's literally what it is. It's Lucifer is as the bringer of light. Lucifer's it's essentially like you know, you talk about the um you know, like when you're enlightened to write poetry, you're like, Oh, you know, the muses, right? You're like the muse basically Lucifer's like in it it is mm-hmm. basically a personification of the muse. You know, the idea of enlightenment. Uh, but personified. It's this Promethean figure, and by Promethean figure I mean if we're talking about the Greek myths, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or the Romans. I don't know if Prometheus was. I think Prometheus was the the Greek term, but Prometheus was this this Titan, right? Right. In Greek, yeah. Who stole the fire from the gods, mm-hmm. right? From Zeus specifically, mm-hmm. and somehow gave it to humanity. And so Zeus punished him by basically crucifying him and having a vulture eat his entrails. And he was immortal, so the, the basically the vulture would come and eat his entrails. And then he would die and be revived and go through it all over again and again and again. But the idea of Prometheus is that Prometheus sacrifices himself to bring the knowledge to humanity. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now, so I'm gonna say this. I, yeah. I just, I just want don't lose your thought. But for those of you who are coming on tonight. I have Brother uh, Manuel back on. He was on the other day, and, and, and people was asking, will he be able to come back? I have him back on. I want to say thank I want to thank him, first of all, for uh, allowing uh, and sharing his time with us. I really want to appreciate it. And I want to say, this information that you're getting here on this show, you're not going to hear, and you're not going to get it from any other show. You're not. This is, what, this is what sets us apart. Yeah, we're a little controversial. But we want to be able to share the light <laughs> of Freemasonry. We want to be able to share. I mean, it's true essence, not not some of the the the. You know, I, I mean, we want to get down to what Masonry should be, and express that on this show. So we want to first greet everybody who's coming on, and please, whatever you do, hit the thumbs up button. We certainly would appreciate it. 
And as I've said, if you want to make a contribution towards the show and you have PayPal, please do that through Jose Lodge uh -huh. uh, at PayPal or however you want to. It, it'll be popping up in just a minute. But we want to say thank you to everyone because you make the show. My Prince Hall brothers, my Modern Free International, whatever your jurisdiction may be, we want to say thank you. So to Brother Manuel, please continue, and I thank you very much. Okay, I, I can take an aside here because you mentioned the, the folks from Prince Hall. So I, I want to make sure that I take an aside here, and I, I need to explain something real quick, okay? Um, and I'll, I want to reiterate this, and I'll explain why it is that I take the stance and why I'm so hard at it, mm -hmm. okay? Um, when I went through the decrees, I came through regular Freemasonry. Okay, I was manipulated into believing that regular Freemasonry stood for all these good things and didn't come to realize that it was ritual, but literally giving money to the royal family of England and furthering these causes of imperialism and putting the poor in their place and the rich in their place and all these things, which I'm completely opposed to. Mm -hmm. I am completely opposed to these things. And side effects of these major, major ways of doing things and major ways of putting people in their place and major ways of taking this planet and putting in a certain way, um, side effects of this, one of the side effects is racism and misogyny. Because in this country, we have the descendants of the children of Africa and the Moorish descent, who, the ones who came here, who are the descendants of slavery, they're the children of the nobility of Africa. Whoa. And this is very evident, if you really just think about it for a second, when you conquer a nation, you conquer a people, you take over a people, mm -hmm. right? You need the regular people. There, you need the craftsmen, you need the fishermen, you need the farmers, you need the smiths, you need the regular crafts people to stay. Mm -hmm. The people you're going to get rid of are the leaders. Okay. Hands on. Those are the people you're going to get rid of. You're not going to get rid of the crafts people because those are the people you just conquered. You need them to do stuff for you. Mm -hmm. The people you need to get rid of. The people, and you need to hear me on this, the people that you need to, get, need to get rid of are the leaders, the nobility, the head advisors, the warrior caste. The warrior caste in every traditional society has been the lesser nobility. And the warrior caste has always been a pathway to greater nobility. Right. Because the war would start as nobles of the chieftains and they would rise up to the position that they could be the most trusted generals of the chieftains and even become chieftains themselves. Mm -hmm. That was the pathway to nobility. This is the way the caste system is in traditional societies everywhere from east to west. Right. And you have to realize that the people who came to these shores shackled and chained uh -huh. were the descendants of the nobility of Africa, wow. of West Africa. And many of them were the descendants of the lineages of Odudue, who was a wizard king from Nigeria, and his lineages um, mostly going from the Igbo and Yoruba lineages. Hey, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. You said some very, you said some very, you said a word Igbo, right? Yeah, the Igbo and the Yoruba. Okay. The people from Nigeria. The, the, these lineages, they actually descend from from the descendants of the, the pharaohs of Egypt. They now, came all the way. There's, there's a lot of documentation on this. I'm going to share some with you. I'm, I'm going to share some with you that, that's supposed to be happening next month. But I, but with the things with, with the way things are, it probably will not be postponed. I am supposed okay. to be brought into the tribe of Igbo next month. No way. Yeah, way. I've, my, my wife and I are being brought into this tribe. They have uh, clothed, they, they have clothed us. They have prepared us. They have done these rites of passage for us. 
Wow. And uh, we have the chief uh, coming uh, along with other dignitaries to perform the ritual and ceremonies for my wife and others who are being brought into the various tribes of Africa. But we are being brought into the Igbo tribe in particular. We're being sponsored by an Igbo family. So I've been doing my little research. Nice. Yeah, yeah. There's there's something I'm I'm gonna hit you with with something crazy here, okay? Go ahead. Okay. You're gonna have to rewind if they come in later on the show. <laughs> oh wow, well, that's just how it is. But I was told this by a really really good brother, good friend of mine, who is the Grand Hierophant and one of the original lineages, and he is tied to the inner order that actually descends from Constantine. We'll get to talking about that in a little bit. And um, this brother literally told me, he said, look, the Minerva degree of the Bavarian order of the Illuminati, I know all of y'all like to talk about the Illuminati. <laughs> okay. The Bavarian order of the Illuminati, the real thing, okay, because I have my own lineage. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have my own lineage. And I literally have an inner lineage called the OIU, which I don't go into the specific name of it. Right. I want to keep it loose, but yeah, I do have my own lineage, and I have ties of amity to two other Illuminati orders. Illuminati Order International and uh, the Grand Brotherhood. Oh, God, they've got a really long name. The Grand Brotherhood of Light Initiates of Greece or something like that. Okay, okay. Okay. Grand Brotherhood of Light, the Illuminati of Greece or something like that. Uh -huh. But we've got two different lineages that we're tied to. They're, they're listed on my, if you go on our website, I'll give you our website eventually. They're listed on there to the mm -hmm. people that we have treaties of amity with. We have treaties of amity with 15 different orders worldwide, and including the Celestial Supreme Council, Brother Debo Taylor L. Shout out to my yeah, brother. Yeah, I know Brother Debo Taylor. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. I love that guy. So, um, Brother Debo and, and the Celestial Supreme Council, they are tied into several different grand, I don't know if it's like a dozen, 14 different grand lodges under their Supreme Council. Right. So, all those, all those folks, we've got ties to many to all those folks. Okay. We are legitimate. Uh, people are like, well, are you legitimate? We're legitimate, man. We've got a treaty of amity with many different legitimate orders of Freemasonry. We are not in alliance with the United Grand Lodge of England, England for, 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 very obvious reasons, as I said. So let's go back into that with the children of Africa and everything. What I wanted to talk about was um, just briefly for these from the nobility, from the nobility of Africa. Okay, mm -hmm. you got to realize where you come from. You got to realize what your ancestry is and how powerful it is. Okay, um, and you have to realize that there is an agenda mm. to keep you in your place. Say that again. There is an agenda to keep you in your place. All right. Okay. And I sincerely, with my whole heart, believe and know. It's it's more than believe. It's like this this sense of knowing. The Prince Hall Order, it is not in your best interest. Okay. And, and I will tell you why. Because the Prince Hall Order basically allies you with the United Grand Lodge of England and the very people, the very people that fund these Grand Lodges that have done so much against people of African and Moorish descent for like 300 years, hands down. Well, I guess that's, I, I, I guess that's why I'm going to stay where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, because you know what's up, you know? And a lot of these brothers, they'll be hitting me up like, oh, well, I'm in Prince Hall order, this and that. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to add you as a friend. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to explain this so you understand where I'm coming from, okay? I will not accept as a friend, I will not add somebody as a friend on my Facebook profile page, somebody who essentially is, is allied to the very people who have conducted these acts who have, or do you need to take home?
brother? No, no, man. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I, I was just going to say, I, I cannot add as friends people who who are allied with these people. Mm. Who, who, who essentially are like, well, you know, it's okay. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, no, sorry. I don't go like that. I don't sit there and tolerate this kind of crap. I don't. Mm -hmm. And I won't. And I won't add people as friends who are part of this alliance. Wow. Wow. You know, okay. That's just, that's just where I stand. Okay. I mean, I look at it like, look, if you're not helping the situation, you're harming the situation. Mm -hmm. And if you're harming the situation, I don't want anything to do with you. It's that simple. Okay, so I and got a question for you. Awful. I got a go question ahead, go for ahead. you. Someone posted, how do you figure all are allies to uh, the Grand Lodge of England that are members of Prince Hall? Because your dues, a part of your dues, you're going to them. Okay. All right. I, I mean... A, 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 little, a little pinch of your, your money is going to them. Okay. So, 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 so I got you. you. You know what I mean? I, I understand what you're so saying. Like, how are you going to tell me, like, oh, well, I'm not? And no, nah, no, nah, dude, your money is where you think your money's going. Let me a tell you. A portion of your dues go to your lodge. From your lodge, a portion go to your grand lodge. A portion of your grand lodge goes back to the United Grand Lodge of England. And who is the grand master of the United Grand Lodge of England? Why don't you take take a good look? Go on to Wikipedia. Do a little bit of you know, make your fingers do a little work. Go on to Wikipedia. And go look at the United Grand Lodge of England and scroll, scroll down, you know, make your fingers roll down the happy little page all the way to the bottom and look at the list of Grand Masters of the, of the United Grand Lodge of England. And look at the one thing they all have in common. Every single one of them is a member of the royal family of England. What does that tell you? Mm. And what does it tell you when you look at the fact that the first Grand Master wasn't elected until 1813? Think about that. How the hell are you going to have a Grand Lodge in existence when you don't have a Grand Master for it? You don't. You don't. So the seventeen seventeen date is a fake. Think about it. Now, I've been told, I was told, I've been reading now, and they're saying that it's 1728. I don't, I don't know how true, but there, I do agree with you about the 1717 date, but now... Some are saying 17, 1728. What is 1728? I, I don't even know where 1728 comes from. Bruh. 1717 is the founding of the Gridiron, uh, Gridiron and Goose Lodge in London. That's where they, 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 they sat down at that bar. They were having a few drinks. Yep. You know, like this corona that I'm having right now. <laughs> which he tested. It's my, my anti-corona right now. I'm kidding. But, uh... You know, the Gridiron and Groove Slots, that's where they sat down for the first time. That mm -hmm. was a bar, basically. Because these, these, these Brits, they like to drink, brothers and sisters. They like to drink. Oh, okay? yeah. So they sat down at the Gridiron and Goose Lodge, and they formed the first Grand Lodge, and it was called the Grand Lodge of London. It was not the Grand United Grand Lodge. There was a Grand Lodge of London, there was a Grand Lodge of York, and there were two or three other Grand Lodges uh -huh. that eventually came out, and then all these united, and then some of the independent lodges united. And when did they unite? They united in 1813. Okay, in 1813, and the first Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge of England is Augustus Frederick. The Duke of Sussex. Do you know who the next Duke of Sussex is? Mm. Well, the point of the, do you know who the very next one is? Oh, who? here's where it gets really interesting. Harry. My man Harry, who married Meghan. Yeah. How about that? Really? He is the next Duke of Sussex. Why is it that there's been no Duke of, Duke of Sussex since? <gasps> yes. Why? 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 Because the Duke of Sussex, the original Duke of Sussex, was seen as a rebel. How about that? Think oh, about and Harry is now way. seen the same Let's way. Let's go into this. Let's go into this. No, I'm going to take it there. Okay. Let's go into this. Let's go into it then. So check, check it out. So the original Grand Duke of Sussex, okay, was seen as a rebel, and he was the first founder of the United Grand Lodge of England, right? Then they took it a totally 
different way to like, whoa, this whole thing, like, okay, wham, under the royal family of England. Mm-hmm. We can, every single grandmaster of the United Grand Lodge of England, look at it, Earl this, Duke that, Baron this, all of them members of the, of the, of the royal family. Every single one. Mm-hmm. People don't believe me. I don't believe that. Okay, good. Look it up. Wow. And then tell me. It's there. There you go. Look it up. Mm. Okay? Now be quiet and just listen. <laughs> Not you, brother. You know what I mean. I, I got you. So, go for it. So then, why is it that Harry is the next Duke of Sussex? Now here's my crazy little theory and nobody has to pay attention to it nobody has to listen to it nobody has to even think about it it's just my own crazy little theory because I'm a crazy guy Mm -hmm. but my own crazy theory is this who is Harry married Meghan Markle yes what is it about Meghan Markle that you would not expect a British royal to be married into she is a woman of African ancestry. Yes, she is. And her father, note this, brother. Note this. Her father is mentioned as descendant of kings, blah, 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 all that happy stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And her mother is simply noted as she descends from slaves. Mm. Now, think about this. We know where the slaves came from. We know where they were the descendants of prisoners of war who came from the castes of nobility and the lesser nobility of Western Africa. If anybody knows these lineages better than anybody else, it's the British. Wow. Because they have documents upon documents upon documents Mm. of where these slaves came from, where they were shipped to, where they went. Mm -hmm. If anybody has acquired that knowledge better than anybody else, it's the British. Okay. So, here's the funny little thing, brother. Talk to me. How is it that they let Elizabeth II's grandson just so happened to marry someone whose half lineage comes from kings and half the lineage comes from slaves. I'll tell you why. You got my ear, man. Because they know who her mother's lineage comes from. Hmm. I am willing to bet that her mother's lineage, I'm willing to bet that her mother's lineage is linked to some royal family in West Africa, probably somewhere in Nigeria, probably something linked to Odudue, and that royal lineage, and that this ends up giving Megan and her descendants, meaning Harry's descendants, meaning the children of the royal family, ownership of certain major things in West Africa. And that is why they have allowed that marriage. That's my little theory on it. So you're saying that that marriage allows the British family a, a like an inroad in some some way or form into into a, a African lineage I think that this is one of going to be one of those quote unquote discoveries mm-hmm. that they're going to oh gee guess what you know it's one of these things that they're going to oh golly gee guess what we just found out so, yes. so do you believe they just can't be in love no, no, no. I, I'm not saying that they... I, I honestly, to be honest with you, yes. I think that... I, I think that... that I, I, I do think that Harry loves Meg. 
They're, I believe. So I, I think they. I think they are. I think they're truly in love. No, I think they're in love. There's, okay. there's definitely. But I think as Megan starts to realize more and more of what she's gotten herself into, I think she starts telling on like we need to move away a little bit. We need to get out of this. <laughs> and that's what they've done. They've actually done that. Exactly. Exactly. She's all like, we need to get up. We, we need to put our little business together. We're gonna put our little business together. <laughs> that's what she's done. Because you know, I, I think. There, where they were going to be at, I think it was last month, sometimes they had this raw family gathering and this was going to be the last time that they are shown together in this raw settings because they was going to distance themselves from the raw family. They was going to not take any of the money, any of the taxes or nothing from them and they was going to start doing their own thing. Right, right. And, 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 and I, I, I got a feeling it's, I, I definitely think it's because Megan has realized um, a little bit. She's got some ideas of what's going on. But to tell you the truth, I sincerely believe that, um, all joking aside, I, I really believe that Megan's mom's lineage, the reason that it's been downplayed like that is because they're getting ready to, to, to put up something in the next that she's had her child, it might not be for another 10, 13, 15 years, might not be until the, the, the children are adults, that they actually let her know that, oh, by the way, you've got claim to blah, blah, blah lineage from wherever in West Africa. Okay. You know, but, but, but I, I, I honestly believe that's the only reason they've, they've made her interest. Because if, if you really, if you think about it, I mean, you really, really need to think about it. You well, know, where, where did the, the, the slave trade come from? Where did these people come from? Where did these, you know, the, the, these, you know... So tell me this here. Tell me this. With all of that that you've just put out in regards to that whole connection, how does ancient primitive rites or Freemasonry fit into, fit into that? I know you was talking about uh, Harry being... Uh, uh, part of of that some type it, it of way fits into, it, it fits into the whole idea of like the agenda between one and the other okay you know it fits into the whole idea of the agenda between the the regular freemasonry versus the conservative uh, excuse me versus the uh, progressive universal freemasonry and that is mm -hmm. the agenda being the progressive universal freemasonry is all about liberty, fraternity, equality, and it's this idea of progressing around, you know, uh, looking for the truth. Okay. You know, so no so what. what you're saying so. is, correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying a progressive type of Freemasonry, is that Freemasonry actually searches for the truth and put out information in regards to Masonry? Yes. And, and it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's a Freemasonry that's really looking for the truth and, and not just looking to push forth an agenda of keeping things in their place. And and I think that, and, and, and that to me is, there are, no matter what, what you want to tell me, there are definitely, definitely two different alliances and they have two completely different agendas. And and one agenda is basically to keep the poor in their, the poor in their place and the, the, and the rich in theirs. And the other agenda is like, no, 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 this status is all wrong. It's unjust. We have to work toward the progress of humanity to make a change. There's two different ways of looking at it. You mm -hmm. can't say one is not the other. They're two opposite ways of looking at things. So we are definitely in the realm of people who are looking at things like the, the status quo is unjust. It's not right. We have to look at it. We have to reassemble it. We have to structure things differently. And we have to help people who are poor and starving and eating mud pies in Africa and in Southeast Asia and Latin America, these children starving to death. We have to change these things. And we can't just sit there and be like, oh, you know, let's not talk about politics and religion because we might make somebody upset. No, the hell with that. Let's talk about what we need to talk about and let's figure out the truth and let's help humanity. That is where we're coming from. So and let, let, let's go to, to take it from there. That that's I, I don't want to. I don't want to take too much time into that. Forgive me. Yes. But, um, the uh, let's go into the, like the the um, the history of the ancient prayer right? because that's I think what it, everybody kind of wanted to go into the um, the history of the um, 
the, the primitive right mm-hmm. of man says in his reign. <clears throat> Give me one second. So basically, ah, forgive me, brother. Go for it. So essentially, if we're talking about the ancient primitive right of Memphis and his reign, mm-hmm. um, we can. I mean, we there's so many different versions of the history. Okay. Mm-hmm. But uh. Okay, well, tell me this here, then. Oh, I'm, let, I'm going to ask you a question. What about the what about the uh, rights of Mizram of 1788? Yeah, we're, we're going to go into all that. Okay, okay. okay. So, so, so basically, Egyptian from Eastern descends from uh, Cagliostro, okay? They're really all linked to Count Cagliostro, and some would say that Perhaps they're linked to the Order of the Sulpicians, um, you know, who were the supposedly linked to the first people that went with Napoleon into Egypt, okay? Napoleon's okay. claim of power is central to the development of esoteric Egyptian Freemasonry. Really? Okay. Yeah. But we're going to go into that in a little bit. So let me take you through uh, some of the ideas, okay? Okay. Um, so if we're looking at Count Cagliostro, okay, mm-hmm. well, one version is that they go back to Count Cagliostro. Okay. Now, supposedly he was initiated by the Master Altothus in 1776 E.B. Era Volgaris, or A.D., if you want to go by the, the older way of uh, talking about things. Okay. So that's the, the date that he was supposedly entered fast and raised or whatever, initiated into the mysteries. Okay, we well, only you know that he was initiated into the mysteries. And uh, now, as far as, like, degrees, uh, who knows? You know, okay. there's also, remember, Freemasonry itself goes back to the 1500s. And, and I have, by the way, by the way, if we want to talk about the primitive right, I think we should come back on another show and talk about the primitive right and the, the first codes of Freemasonry, because I've got pictures, photos that I took with my cell phone of a painting at the um, at the Getty Center in Los Angeles mm-hmm. of a painting of a painting that comes from the late 1500s okay, that has all of the key symbols of Freemasonry all of the key symbols of Freemasonry and it is an old um, I can't remember if it's a French or Italian painting but we can go into that I can look for it into my files So, so tell me this here T- tell me this here, because someone put put in the chat line before we had gotten into the Megan thing. You was you was actually into the Illuminati. And you was given a different fractions or different jurisdictions within the Illuminati. Uh, someone wants you to elaborate on that. Is that possible? Oh uh, boy. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati. Okay. They. Realistically, they were working toward the progress of humanity. Okay, they were basically the um, the staple of progressive universal Freemasonry, mm-hmm. and 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 they were the ones who gave progressive universal Freemasonry their their own. Okay, um, the the French Revolution is probably indebted to them. Okay. At the beginning, at least. The the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati probably had a lot to do with the original planning stages of the revolution. And mm-hmm. then later on, it was infiltrated by British agents. And I would say that because if you look at the last year of the life of uh, Louis-Philippe II, who was the Grand Duke of Orléans, and he was the Grand Master of the Grand Oite de France. And what year was it? It was, um, if you look about, one second, let me think here. Um, he, he basically was the, the Grand Master of the Grand Oite de France. And in his last year, he was suddenly, even though he had done everything for the sake of the revolution, of the Mm -hmm. French Revolution. Suddenly, he found himself being hunted and captured, 
and uh, put in prison, and uh, it's, and eventually got his head chopped off, right? Okay. Um, and yet, this man had done everything in favor of the revolution. Now, here's the funny thing. Here's the really, really funny thing. His son, his son, and his son's quote-unquote best friend, okay, his son's best friend, they escaped the, um, the revolution, and they went to guess where? Guess what country gave them shelter? United States? Britain. Really? Okay. Yeah. And this is where it gets really neat. Guess who came back, like, 20 to 30 years later, and was crowned King of France and backed up by the British? I'm not going to go. You tell me. I'm listening. His son. Hmm. His son. Interesting. So, Louis Philippe the First, King of the French, okay, um, was actually put on the throne in 1830. Mm hmm. Okay. He was king of the French from 1830 to about 1848. Okay. He was born, born by the British. Pretty much directly after Napoleon. Okay. Napoleon is very central to the development of, uh, you know, esoteric formation, right? And Napoleon, as we know, if, if we look at Napoleon Bonaparte, he was very uh, much in favor of the of, of, of European, you know, progressive Freemasonry. Well, so, Freemasonry so ones, tell me this right? here. What about the, uh, I want to make sure I say this right, uh, Jewish right or uh, uh, spelled J-E-S-U-I-T right? Oh, the Jesuit, right? Oh, Jesuit. Thank you. Oh, who said anything about the Jesuits? That's that's because what's the thing was brought up in the Jesuit learning school? Um, uh, the, the, the the first founder of the Illuminati was you he? You know, uh, Spartacus. Um, he was brought up as as the uh, well, his code name was Spartacus, but um, what's his face? Weishaupt, Adam Weishaupt. He he was brought up in the Jesuit learning program. So, is the Jesuits connected to the Catholic Church? I mean, the Jesuits are an order within the Roman Catholic Church. They were the, uh, the Jesuits were basically the counter-intel, intel organization within the Roman Catholic Church for hundreds of years and still are. They, um, well, at the beginning, they were definitely the assassins of the church. So are um, they like, like, are they uh, like our today see, uh, 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 central intelligence agencies? Uh, CIA is 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 that they would, who they're? They would, they would be like. I mean, are you are you asking me if they are like the CIA of the Roman Church? Yes. Mm, kind of, yeah. Okay. Okay. You no, know, I mean, not not not, quote unquote, officially, but unofficially, yeah, they pretty much are. Okay. I mean, their ritual includes the giving to them of the dagger and swearing that they will slay any of Christ's enemies opposed to the church, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, that sounds almost yeah, like yeah. the Knights Templars. No, man. The Knights Templar are definitely an Islamic esoteric order, man. Wait a minute. I mean, that, that, hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on. Hold on, hold on. You're telling me that the Knights Templars are esoteric Islamic order? Oh, 100%. Really? You got my attention now. I'm away. Talk to me. The Knights Templar, the very first founder, Hugh de Payan, de Payan means of the pagans. His last name means of the pagans because they used to refer to the Muslims as the pagans, even though, ironically, Islam is a monotheistic faith. It's, you know, Islam and Judaism are the two halves of the Abrahamic faith. But, um, Hugh de Payen was the grandson of the Baltimore, who was a grand sheikh of a Shia Sufi order. And this is pretty much well known. I mean, you, you can, there's well, some I'm, really I, great. I've seen this brother, his name is Timothy. 
uh, Latrice Wood put in there Sufi, and then you came out with it. So I'm like, well, damn, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 to solve the Sufism, I mean, I've been initiated in three different Sufi. So, so why yeah, do the, the Knights Temple of Weather Cross? Uh, well, I mean, the cross that the Knights Temple wore is not necessarily like the cross of Jesus. Is I mean, it's interpreted in that way. But we all know that, like, the cross is really symbolic of the four alchemical elements. Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. You know, and, and the four directions north, south, east, west. Mm hmm. Right? But, you know, people want to interpret it as, like, and, and see, here's the thing within the Gnosis, when we look at the I N R I and we look at the meaning of the crucifixion, the crucifixion is symbolic. Mm -hmm. And the inner meaning. This is going to get into Constantine and the foundation of like an ancient order that he established, and how Christianity was really more than anything an umbrella organization for the inner orders. Christianity was an outer umbrella organization for the organization of the pagan mysteries to maintain and preserve the old pagan initiations, the mysteries, and streamline them into one complete umbrella organization. And you know, you you say that. You say that, but I've said many times before when 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 people who join church, when they become churchy, I tell them all the time, you just been initiated. And they look at me like I'm crazy. I said, no, you were initiated. Yeah. I mean, don't even try to talk to those folks. You know, I mean, when people have been brainwashed, they've been brainwashed. And you just got to let them go. You know, there's a lot of people. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people we got to let go. That's why, like, when people contact me and they're like oh i'm with the prince hall i'm like no nah, sorry man you're you're like you work for the enemy i can't add you i'm mm. sorry what is, well but brother how can you tell me because bro where did your money go where did your money go you're sending your money to the enemy how wow. the hell am i going to add you and when you're sending your money to the enemy how wow come See, on now i i did i would heard i i actually heard that that's that was what was happening but i don't have anything the in, in to say this is exactly what's taking place, but you I, I don't I, I, I don't I don't play around and I don't see I'm one of the few orders I I'm one of the, the heads, excuse me, of the few orders that does not play around. Okay. Does not say, hey, you know what? Yeah, we'll take whoever comes this way, we'll take your money, whatever. No, sorry. We don't work like that. Right. We're not here to get rich, we're not here to take money, we're here to do things the right way. And if you're giving money to the wrong direction, I, I mean, I know a lot of Rosicrucian orders, they'll be like, oh, yeah, man, like, he's a regular Freemason, but he's also part of the AMOIC. Great. Wonderful. So how the hell are you going to legitimize the fact that he's a part of an establishment that works in favor of racism, misogyny, and imperialism, and yet at the same time, he is working toward the progress of humanity. Yay. Okay, so that to me seems like a horse load of horse crap. Okay. Okay. And I am not going to sit here and be like, yeah, let me take your hand, let me bring you in, let me tuck you in, and let me make you feel welcome when you're giving money to the people who are corrupting this earth. Mm. Sorry, that's not going to happen. Okay? I'm not going to do it. I'm sorry. Not going to happen. Ever. Ever. Put okay. a bullet in my forehead if you want, but it's not going to happen. Okay. Okay. I, I, I just had to bring you know, that up. I mean, I was, up. you know. You know what I mean? I, I, that's the way I look at it. And, and people are like, oh, well, you know, brother, you should, I shouldn't what? I shouldn't tell the truth. I shouldn't, I shouldn't hold myself to a higher standard. I shouldn't hold everybody to the same standard. Really? No, I don't think so. That's not the way this works. The way that this works is like this. I'll tell you how this works. Okay? Mm -hmm. it works like this. If if you are working toward a certain agenda, mm -hmm. then you're in that camp. Okay? And you're working toward the opposite agenda, then you are in the other camp. So this idea of like, well, I like to jump back and forth, then you, it, it, I don't know what the hell you're about, but... I want nothing to do with you. So do you believe that most Masons who join Freemason has forgotten the reason they really join? I think most Masons in Freemasonry, I don't think they even know what the hell they're talking about, to be honest with you. I mean, Freemasonry in the U.S. is, is a mess. It's, 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 a load of, it's a load of BS. Because I often wonder, I know why I joined, 
And that's why I stayed in the particular lodge I'm in and the jurisdiction I'm in. But I often want to do other people know the reason why they join. Because as I matured in Freemasonry, now there was a time I was a hothead because I thought I knew Freemasonry because I knew the book. I can quote you. I can I can run it down word for word. And then as I began to travel and visit other Masonic lodges and go outside of this country, I began to see things a little bit differently. So when I came back and I was talking to the elders of my lodge, they would say, oh, don't don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Because I had began to uh, begin to read about Osiris and and Thor and those legends and all of that and how they was connected. So as I was maturing in Freemasonry, the elders, the elders was like, no, nah, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that, Brother Hawkins. You know, that's that's not what we teach here. But as I've grown, I'm finding out that this is more connected to Freemasonry than me knowing, are you off of from, you know, sort of linguistic conversation that some Masons like to have. I'm finding that it is much broader. Masonry is way out the box in some cases. What what some may consider regular is really not, is more normal. And those who consider what is normal is really not. It is like way out the box. So I'm just finding that masonry itself is is, is bigger than where a lot of us is at. Yeah, it, it's it, uh, now to be honest with you, people that are affiliated with quote unquote regular Freemasonry, right, with the United Grand Lodge of England. I mean, if they if they send us a copy of letter of resignation along with their ex their acceptance letter of resignation from the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge, we have no problem joining them to the order at that point. But as long as they are paying members of a Grand Lodge affiliated with the United Grand Lodge of England, I will not accept them in my order. So it, it's kind of like, it's very simple. It's like, well, I don't want to be a part of, you know, uh, a, a, an organization that uh, caters to imperialism and get, okay, great. Well, if you don't want to be a part of that, then go ahead and send in a letter of resignation. You know, put your money where your mouth is. You know, send in a letter of resignation, send us a copy of that. We'll be more than happy to put you in the order. Other than that, sorry, man. If you want to be a part of those guys, then you're going to be a part of those guys. If you want to send in your money over there to do that, then you're sending your money over there to do that. You know, that's just the way it is. A anyway, we're getting way, way off track. Let me, <laughs> let's, let's, yeah, we, we're totally going like way all over. Um, let's, let's talk about the, the, the history of the ancient primitive pride, shall we? Go for uh, it. Just a little bit about the history of my own order and uh, get into that because we're like all over the damn place. Um, it's a so, good conversation. Um, I'm, I'm really learning a lot and I'm listening and I'm looking at the chat room. So the questions that I'm asking you are, are coming from the chat room. So, yes, today we're pretty much kind of like all over the place. And I know the subtitle is supposed to be about the ancient primitive rites. In this history, I know. We gotta so, back there. you know, let's okay. Let's go back there. Okay, so, so, um, in my own history of the ancient primitive rite, I say in the beginning, I say we could go into the many accounts found in multiple ancient cultures of the mysterious amphibious star gods that fell from heaven and begat the ancient prophets of humanity. And, and, and I put further, we can speak of many controversial things of which most are not aware and of which those who are aware choose to generally keep silent. What I mean by that is, if you look at the Neph, the symbol of the, the eye and the triangle over the flying egg with all the symbols in it. Yes. The flying egg is literally symbolic of two things, okay? Um, and again, we're going to get controversial. The flying egg is the UFO. Okay. And it is also symbolic of the genesis of humanity from the ancestors from the other planets and the other stars and the three star systems that can be viewed, the three stars that can be viewed from the king's chamber, um, you know, in, in, uh, in, in Giza. You know, that, that you can view from the king's chamber in Cheops, in the pyramid of Cheops, you can view three different stars. And that's the three dots of Freemasonry. And those mm -hmm. are the stars that our ancestors came from. And this is traditional esoteric Egyptian Freemasonry. 
that we go back to these ancestors and we go back to this idea that um, these ancestors of humanity came from among the stars. Uh, and, and that is a part of much of esoteric initiation, including, uh, for example, our inner order, the Sangreal Sodality, which we are, and, and the Sangreal Sodality is under Jacobus Swart. Shout out to him. Mm-hmm. Jacobus Swart is the head of the Sangreal Sodality. But the Sangreal Sodality is structured in a very, um, um, like in a very individualistic manner that you can, you can essentially set up autonomous uh, chapters, okay, or lodges or what have you. So we're setting up autonomous lodges of the Sangreal Sodality within our own order, okay? But the order itself is under Jack Swart, so everything's like checked under him. Now, the Sangreal Sodality, in its catechism, pretty much straightforward tells you that the Sangreal, the Holy Blood, comes from, you know, humans who have a bit of DNA from the ancestors from other planets. It's, it's in that catechism. It's in the teaching. And it's in esoteric teaching. So we, we the thing about, um, are UFOs real, extraterrestrials real? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we don't talk about it much. We don't talk about their sources much. Um, but we all know they're there. I mean, there's documented dozens and dozens and dozens of, of documented accounts from professional pilots, military pilots, I mean, right. you name it. My own grandfather, when he was in Cusco, my grandfather, who never lied. And so this, this man was like one of the most hardcore, legitimate people that I've ever known. My grand, my maternal grandfather, whom I called Papa Fernando Contreras, he, he, he literally told my mom, Okay, that when he went to Cusco, there was one time when he was driving, my, my, my grandfather and my grandmother both swore on their lives, on their ancestors' souls, that they saw this. They were literally driving. They stopped at one point on a highway in Cusco in the mountains in Peru, and all of a sudden they saw this thing up in, in the sky, and they stopped, and they were like, what the hell is that? It was like this silver shining disc, and it, and it basically hovered there. And it was the shining metal disc mm. that hovered there. And then it zipped out in a zigzag way and it disappeared. Now, here's the funny thing, okay? My mother told me this maybe when I was like 12 or 14 years of age, right? And now, years later, I'm downloading books on PDF and whatnot. And one of these books that I downloaded, okay, was by... um. What's his name? Mars is his last name. M A R R S. He's the same guy who wrote the Fourth Reich or the Rise of the Fourth Reich. Okay, it's a pretty interesting book. If you want to read it, it's got a lot of great stuff in it. But anyway, um, he wrote this other book, and I'm trying to think of the name of it. I can't think of it. I'll, I'll have to get it for you for the next show. But his name was Mars, and last name was Mars. M A R R S. Mm-hmm. And he had a show. I think it was I, I, not a show, a book. I think it was called Beyond Top Secret or something like that. And um, with a number of different sections on all of these different uh, conspiracies, if you will, right? <laughs> so one of them was the uh, the UFOs in New Mexico, mm-hmm. right? So we so we began to talk about the UFOs in New Mexico, and. I was I was reading this book that I just downloaded and I looked at it and all of a sudden it said something about Jim somebody Martin. mentioned something about the Anunnaki's. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Anunnaki or the uh, yeah the Anunnaki's. Um, so Jim Mars, Jim Mars, is talking about this and in his book he says something about that they that the UFOs were witnessed moving in a zigzag formation. So does that have anything to probably do with Jacob's Ladder? No, no, no. What I'm saying is, listen, what I'm saying is that my grandfather, many years before, when I was 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, he had told me that he had seen this thing and it was moving in a zigzag formation. Right. 
I mean, he literally told me, get moved like this, like a zigzag, right? Who the hell would know that? That's what he told me. I was like 13 years old. He told me that, and my mom was there, and my grandmother was like, yeah, it moved like this. My grandmother said, and she was like, it moved like this. And I was like, what? That's weird. And then many years later, right, like 20-some mm-hmm. years later, I download this PDF that, guess what? It's talking about how the pilots witnessed these things moving in a zigzag formation. How crazy is that? It's interesting. I remember showing I remember showing my mother that and going like, look, look at this mom, look at this book, look what it says. And I showed that to my mom and my mom's like, I see Dios mio see. Si. You know, Papa Papa never lied. Papa Papa was the nickname we had for my grandfather. Hmm. You know? I, I mean that literally says something to me that my grandfather would tell me like when I'm twelve, thirteen years old that these things zigzag and twenty some years later I download some file and it says exactly that. Hey, guess what? These things zigzag through 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 the air. I mean, that's not coincidence, brother. That's the this is the way these things really move. That's that's the fact that these things really exist. So the idea that UFOs don't exist, sorry, they do exist. Um, and our race yeah, we're linked to the ancestors from space. That's the whole nature of the Neff. Maybe you don't like to hear that. But that's, that's the nature that's of the true. what? The Neff. The, the Neff. K N E P H. Oh, you okay. Know, the sigil has the the um the tri the eye in the triangle over the flying egg. Mm-hmm. You know that that's what it is. Oh, it's okay. supposed to be the idea is that the the. The symbol of it is that the, the flying egg is supposed to be two things. It's supposed to be a flying disc, and at the same time, it's supposed to symbolize the genesis of humanity. Oh. That it came flying out from space. That's what it means. And the idea of the, the eye and the triangle, well, it's this idea of this divinely endowed whatever the hell, you know? Um, we, we tend to think of... Things in a biblical way, especially because this is a quote unquote Judeo Christian nation and um, Christianity has very little to do with Judaism, but you know, people tend to think it does. Oh, you anyway, remember that um, you, you, there was a book you was trying to think of by Jim Mars. The book is called uh, Ruled by Secrecy, and I want to thank Brother uh, Black. Ancient Free and Accepted Network for bringing that up. It's another one. It's another one. But, but there are several books written by him. I don't know if it's that one. Uh-huh. Let, let me look it up. Let me, let me see if I can find it. Because I don't think it's that one. There are a number of different books. It might be that one. But there, there are a lot of different ones by Jim Mars. Mm-hmm. There was that one. The one about the Fourth Reich. The Rise of the Fourth Reich is also excellent, by the way. That one is, is also phenomenal, The Rise of the Fourth Reich. Um, but um, let me see, where's this list of books? Books. Crossfire, Alien Agenda, Rule by Secrecy, Inside Job, Rise of the Fourth Reich. No, it's this one. It's Above Top, Se- Above Top Secret, Uncover the Mysteries of the Digital Age. That's the one. So tell, me, so, so tell me this here. When I mentioned Jacob's Ladder a while ago, Here's what I, oh, yeah. in, when I mentioned Jacob's Ladder, because in in the in the es, in the essence of mentioning Jacob's Ladder, there was he was in a meditative state uh, to where he seen angelic angelic beings coming and going from earth to heaven. That's why I mentioned that when you brought up the ideal of seeing. Uh, or, or being told in regards to your grandfather seeing the UFO. So I thought of Jacob's Ladder in, in, in that respect because most people, when they get into Freemasonry, it's, it has its moments. I mean, that's why I tell people all the time, when you really get into Freemasonry, you got to have to leave some breadcrumbs along the way because it has many doors that you can go into. Some doors you don't want to yeah. open and some doors you're like, yeah, I like this. So you have to be careful in regards to the door that you may open, just like these degrees that we have. These degrees lead into various doors 
of knowledge and wisdom that some may say I like and some may say that's a little too much for me. So therefore, as a seeker of truth, a seeker who wants to understand that which is before him in his life or in her life journey, because let's have an understanding. There are female masons. I know like a lot of brothers like say whatever, but that is, but it is true. And we're going to talk about that on another show because I want to break down some things in regards to that. Because a lot of people say females can be Mason, but that's for another show. Yep. However, for under fifty years, man. Oh yeah. So as we as we begin to guide ourselves in this thing called Freemasonry, I often say, and I tell everybody, please, whatever you do, drop some breadcrumbs along the way because there are many levels to this. And just because you are here in America, that doesn't mean that you have all of the rights and privileges to Freemasonry because I would guarantee you, you go to Haiti, that's a whole nother ball game in Freemasonry. Okay? That's, and we're, and let, let, me talk, let me talk about our lineage then because our lineage is very closely linked to Haiti. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, so, let's go back. So, initially, the ancient friend of right goes back to... Um, uh, Cagliostro, okay, 1776. Okay. 1784, on Christmas Eve, he and his wife, Countess Serafina, they found the fixed, uh, first mixed lodge. Okay, mixed lodge means open to men and women, okay, of Egyptian formation. It's called La Sagesse de Lyon at Lyon, at the city of Lyon, okay. From that point on, they founded other lodges, okay. Right about the same time, you got the order of the Philips, they were also known as the French Truth. They were also known as the Unknown Philosophers. This is also linked to Martinism. That's going to be another show, hopefully. Mm -hmm. The esoteric, this esoteric Masonic order begins with a famous lodge called Les Amis Leonis. The reunited, the reunited France in Paris in 1773 of the Common Era. Okay. Okay. And then these numbers, they came from influential members of society, nobility, etc. They were all tied into Freemasonry in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, from this point on, here's where all the hoopla comes in, where everybody's like, no, this is the real lineage. No, this is the, the one. So one group of people says that the right of Mizraim comes from one of the brothers of the Philalets, known as Abraham. And that's from 1801 EV. Other people say that comes from the Sophicians. The <clears throat> Sophicians are basically, now Jean-Louis de Biasi has this book called Esoteric Freemasonry, where he basically makes it sound like everything came from the Sophicians. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's his, that's his uh, way of looking at things. And, of course, it just happens to be that he happens to be the inheritor of the Sacred Order of the Sophistians. Of course, the thing about Jean-Louis de Biasi, if I may take an aside, that I really wonder about, and the reason why I really question him is, here's the guy who was initiated to the highest levels of the Grand Orient de France. Okay. Okay. He was initiated to the highest levels of the Grand Order Egyptian, right? The Egyptian right that's tied into the Grand Orient of France. Mm -hmm. And yet, he gets to those highest ranks, and he's also the head of the OKR plus C, the Kabbalistic Rosicrucian Order, right? He's the head of that order, right? And he's the head of all these orders, but then he comes to the U.S., he decides to move to the U.S. for whatever reason. I don't mm -hmm. know why the hell he came to the U.S., but he moves to the U.S. He moves to Las Vegas, he moves to the desert. Why he moved to Las Vegas, I have no idea. He likes to dance on stage. I don't know. So he's in Las Vegas, okay? Moves to the States, and guess what he does? He joins regular Freemasonry. So all of a sudden, all of his titles are kind of like cast aside, and he's now a regular 32nd degree, quote unquote, Scottish Rite Mason. Now, to me, mm -hmm. that's like kind of a sellout move, you know? The only reason why you would do that is to try to get more popularity for your esoteric order. Okay. To me, it's kind of a sellout move to like selling out to people that you know have no business 
even in esoteric circle, but you, you're like, oh, well, they've got three million people, so I'm going to sell out to them and I'm going to join them. Because as we all know, when you come to this country, like the orders, the, I mean, if, if you join the Grand Orient de France out here, the Grand Orient de France in Amérique, as I said, the French know progressive Freemasonry and they're progressive in all things except spreading. There's like three lodges of Grand Orient de uh, France in Amérique in this country. Mm-hmm. There's like a lodge in New York and D.C. And, and in L.A. I think they might have one in San Francisco. But they're tiny. They're small. They don't know how to spread. Because, like I said, you know, they take a year to go from Enter to Princess to Fellowcraft, and a year to go from Fellowcraft to Master Mason, another year so you can go to the higher degrees, and by that time, most of the people have not even one, stayed on. One, one brother just and, posted, um, one brother posted, you cannot be a Christian in this. Well, you know, I'm going to comment on that. When you say that you cannot be a Christian, first of all, go back and look at that for a minute when you say Christian. And and then we can have that conversation because that 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 Christian thing, as I began in my own journey, I had to become deprogrammed to a lot of stuff that I was taught. It's it's something to make you think, bro. It's just something to make you think. But go ahead. Well, I mean, to, to me, Christianity. Well, look, you you can totally be a right wing or even a left wing, you know, standard white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christian or black Christian or white Christian or Latino Christian or Protestant or Roman Catholic or whatever, and be a standard Pauline Christian and be part of regular, regular Freemasonry. Uh, when it comes to the more progressive and esoteric Freemasonry, you kind of have to come face to face with the fact that Christianity is a pagan religion and it comes from a pagan source. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay? It just has to be accepted for what it is. It's a Greco-Roman faith. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. I Like, um, my buddy Nick Farrell, who just published his, his next book, like Helio something or other, I'm sorry, I can't, Nick, forgive me, I can't remember the name of your new book, mm-hmm. but he just published it. He's a great writer. He publishes a lot of stuff on Golden Dawn stuff material, I'm, right? I'm, I'm going to say this. Another great writer, Aaron Leach. Aaron Leach publishes some great stuff also. Both of them great writers. And Nick certainly leans in, in the in pagan tradition. And many others work the, 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 the magic lean in the pagan tradition. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the, the notion that Christianity is the continuation of Judaism never has been. Mm. Never will be. Sorry. It, I mean, I know you're going to want to argue with me, but <laughs> no, sorry, it's not. Look at it. I mean, and if you want to argue historically, you're, you're going to lose. You know? Because I know the history pretty damn well. So I majored in it in college. So so in in saying that, I know we're probably all over the map tonight. This is just one of them shows people are gonna be like, when well, damn, this is all of it is interesting to me. I'm just gonna be honest with you. And 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 the reason no. we the reason we've been jumping from subject Huh? A lot of people gonna hate me. Oh, no, no, no. See, that's the difference between this show and other shows. We, you know, sometimes we're pretty structured and sometimes we just all over the map. And today is just one of them days that's the subject title. And what we're talking about is 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 really we're just really all over the map. And I hope well, that people. Well, let, well, let's do this, brother. Let me let me real quick before the end of the show. Let me just go through the history of the ancient Pembroke. And let me I'm going to try to stay on point. Go through the history real quick and address the things of my order, and then we can go off on other things because it's we've already been on for like an hour and 15 minutes. And um, let me at least go through the history, where my lineage comes from, where my order comes from, and then from there, people want to throw other things, they can throw other things. Okay. You know? Go so, ahead. Um, uh, you you got it. So, so, so let's get back to it just real quick. Okay. So basically, um, as I said, Goes back to Caliostra from there, the French truth, all these 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 orders. Um, and uh, and if you want to rewind to what we were talking about, you can rewind in the show. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, basically, so there's the um, Les Amis Réunis in Paris in 1773. And then in the late late 1700s, early 1800s, this is where, you know, um, Napoleon's uh, invasion of Egypt takes place, right? Um, And actually, when he came to power, Okay, this is this is a neat point. In, in June, on June twenty second of seventeen ninety nine, which was the twenty first day, of the third year of the the you know, basically it, there was a a treaty, a text of nine articles was signed on June twenty second of seventeen ninety nine that unified the Grand Lodge de France with the Grand Orient de France, and this was under Napoleon. Okay. So, in addition to this, there were some of the so-called Scottish lodges were basically the, um, um, I think at this point, they were right on the cusp of establishing the ancient accepted Scottish rite. They had already founded the Rite of Sir No, and it was already being evolved into the 33 rite of the ancient accepted Scottish rite, which is found, of course, um, in um, in Charleston on May 31st of 1801, okay? And so we need to understand that this is going on in the 1800s. At the same time that this is being founded in the Rite of Cerno, mm-hmm. we have the development of the ancient and primitive rite of this reign taking place. Now, now uh, apparently, supposedly, in, in one account, they said that it was the Sophistians, and from the Sophistians that, that the ancient primitive rite comes from. And that was an order that was formed in 1801 of the Common Era upon the return of the expedition from Napoleon and his forces into Egypt. Another account says that, no, 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 it was this brother named Abraham. He was in the order of the Philolets. Another order that also had brethren with Napoleon going into Egypt and coming back. And, and then other people are like, no, 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 it was way before that. Here's another account. Way before that, 1782. Jad Ben Arid had a vision of an Egyptian sage. Here's the strangest, the most interesting one. He had a vision of an Egyptian sage known as Ananiah, which in Hebrew means the cloud of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Okay, and supposedly this sage initiated him to the mysteries of Egyptian esoteric Freemasonry. Okay, now these are very, very different views, right? Okay. You look at whatever the case may be, the right of misreign is, is chartered, whatever it may be, in Venice in 1788 of the Common Era. This is the right of misreign with the 90 degrees, and a few years later, it's chartered in Naples and Milan. Mm. Okay? And so between the years of about 1810 and 1813, you have the Bitterese brothers, who are Joseph, Mark, and Michel. And they receive their charter. They begin to expand the right of Mizraim. And now it's finally founded and chartered in Paris in 1814 of the Common Era. Okay. Era of Goddard, okay? So now the, the right of Mizraim is officially found in Paris in 1814, but it's been founded elsewhere from between 18, 1788 and 1813. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, it's founded with 90 degrees, and the last four degrees are known as the Arcana Arcanorum. 87th, 88th, 89th, and 90th. These are the degrees that when we talk about the ancient primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim, like I said, we mentioned in the last show, the first 86 degrees are Memphis, 87 to 90 are Mizraim, and then mm-hmm. go back to Memphis. Right? Okay. So the Arcana form comes from Mizraim. So the Grand Lodge that's in charge of the Mizraim, the strict Mizraim rite, is called the Grand Lodge Mondial de Mizraim. Right. World, worldwide Grand Lodge of Mizraim, which is at JLMM.FM, if any folks are interested in looking that up. Now, after that, we have a foundation of the ancient Primrite of Memphis at Montalban. And you see this constantly, Montalban, 1815, right? 1815 in the Common Era. And this is with the disciples of Memphis, the disciples of the Memphis with Samuel Honis as its grandmaster, right? Samuel Oni mm-hmm. as its grandmaster. This was co-founded with Gabriel Mathieu Marconi de Neva. Okay? And this becomes the foundational lodge 
on the right of Memphis. And this was taken over by Gabriel Mathieu Mahoney de Negre right after that. And in 1834 of the Common Era, then the son of Gabriel Mathieu Mahoney de Negre, who is Jacques Etienne Mahoney de Negre, is, 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 he, he constitutes the right of Memphis in Paris. And the right of Memphis becomes known as the ancient primitive right of Memphis. And, and, and it begins, believe it or not, with 90 degrees, then it's expanded to 92 degrees, then it's expanded to 95 degrees. That's where it's most popular, most famous, in 95 degrees. Then from there, it jumps up to 97 degrees, right? Mm. For a time, it's shortened down by John Yarker with the ancient A-N-T-I-E-N-T and primitive right. Whenever you see A-N-T-I-E-N-T and primitive right with the, the inner T, that denotes the condensed right. And the condensed right was basically where you took the most important philosophical degrees. Okay, this is going to get a little confusing. So you know how from the fourth to the 33rd degree, right, we only really do the lecture. We do the lectures in most degrees, and then the actual initiations that are not even actually done, but they're witnessed, mm -hmm. are done in in certain degrees, right? Yes. And the others are kind of like just basically like here, read the lecture, repeat the oath, whatever, mm -hmm. you're, you're done, right? Okay, so in the, in the shortened, the condensed form, what they did was basically they tossed out all of those degrees that are not really initiated uh -huh. and from the fourth to the 33rd degree i believe the degrees that are actually the work degrees are the fourth to the 20th degree mm. okay it gets a little confusing like i said and then from the 21st to the 33rd degree these are the degrees from the 34th to the 95th degree that are actually worked. How's so do you, do you think that a person who's seeking to become members of the primitive rites, do you think or believe that they need to have their... The ancient primitive the, rites. Huh? The primitive rites, the 1500s, the other one. The, the primitive ancient rites, primitive rites. Yeah. Okay, so individuals who may be seeking to become members of the ancient primitive rites, do you believe that they should first get the preceding degrees as, as far as the Scottish Rite or York Rite, and then proceed to go into those degrees? What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm trying to understand the question, because... The question uh, is, is that... A, here, the question is, you have a Mason, and let's say, for instance, he's just... He's, he's, he's found to be a master Mason, okay? He's been raised, okay. he's, he's done that. Now he's looking yeah, he's to... He's looking to become a member of the ancient primitive rites. Do you believe that he should already have previous degrees such as on the York Rite and Scottish Rite as far as we know of in America? Or what What? What should be his route? I, I mean, uh, honestly, if, if he's a Master Mason in the York Rite, then he definitely needs to be properly initiated in the intern apprentice fellow craft and master mason degrees. Okay. I know they're not going to want to hear that, but absolutely. So I what would be the proper why? way of being initiated in the first, second, and third degree? Yeah, if they have not been initiated in an esoteric rite, meaning the ancient accepted Scottish rite, the ancient... That's Red what Red I'm Memphis, saying. The ancient Red Miss Rain, uh -huh. then... Yeah, you need to do... do like me, I was... I. Here's the thing, like, let me tell you a little bit about myself, okay? When I, w when I joined the Gran Loja Hispana in Norte America under David Munoz, right, which, which David Munoz was the master of the lodge in Los Angeles. Horse right, that's, you that's, know, that's that, yeah, that's, that's Shout my guy. Munoz. And, and by the way, if any of y'all want to get in contact with somebody who is, um, like a real, a real legitimate, um, Masonic brother. I mean, Dave Munoz, much respect to him. Okay. Yes. That's my guy. So I've he, learned a lot. That's so, why I'm talking about this. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's a good guy. So David 
was that he was actually one who told me that the steps, because you realize the steps are the points of the spear aren't the middle pillar going through the middle of the Jackie and Boaz. And right. I was like, really? He goes, yeah. So anyway, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So see, like these things, like you don't have the steps in the York, right? You don't have the steps going through the two pillars. You don't have the master ceremonies. You don't have the alchemical degrees, the alchemical elements. You don't have anything that makes it like a true outer gateway to the inner mysteries. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have any. You have these passwords and tokens, which are simply ways to join the social club. Right. And see, I'm, I'm going to say this. When, when, when I first went visiting various lodges and I was introduced to, uh, at that time, Grandmaster Dave Munoz, the, the, the things that they was doing, I just sit back and watch. So I learned about the, 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 the orator and how the orator walked around and, the, and where the two right. pillars are. The two pillars are nowhere like they are in a, what would you call a regular Grand Lodge in, in the United States. These pillars are nowhere near. And you have the Grand Orator who does the job of a senior deacon. And, and you have those who sit at the two pillars and you better not dare walk between them because you're liable to get cut up. So, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a little different. It depends now. Now, here's the thing that here's the other funny thing that an, an ancient except the Scottish Rite Lodge in Latin America tends to do things a little bit different from uh, an ancient except the Scottish Rite Lodge in France. In, in, in the AASR Lodge in France, the um, the altar is pretty much right next to the Worshipful Master's yes. um, desk. And in the American uh, AESR Lodge, the altar is much closer to the middle, like in the standard quote-unquote Blue Lodge thing. But it's still an esoteric opening where um, the dagger even, here, here's another thing, the Chris dagger, that's the flaming dagger that's on the, the sacred book, which can be a blank open book. Mm -hmm. In progressive universal Freemasonry, by the way, it doesn't have to be the Bible, but in um, more traditional lodges, it may, a Scottish Rite Lodge, it's usually a biblical book. But the dagger, it's going to point toward the junior warden or the senior warden or the uh, or the worshipful master, depending on which degree you're working on, because the energy is drawing forth from one or the other. And, and these are esoteric things that people don't think about because the York right, you don't have any of that. So because it's not a magical it's not a magical degree. In in the ancient of the Scottish right, the degrees, the rituals are they're they're essentially a very simplistic form of ceremonial magic. Mm. And, and See, that's something that most people do not realize. I got hey, I gotta talk about that ceremonial magic, man. I got I wanna go into oh, that. Boy. That's gonna be for another show. <laughs> but I gotta that's get to that. For another show. But let me, so let's go back to the to, to the history of this. So so right around the time that the, the late 1700s, early 1800s, when the ancient and primitive right is being founded, right, we also have right around that time the foundation of the ancient and accepted Scottish right. So by the time the foundation of the right of Memphis in 1815, right, we already have the ancient and accepted Scottish right in place, and the first 33 degrees of the ancient except uh, the ancient and primitive right of Memphis happened to be the same 33 degrees of the ancient except the Scottish right. So obviously Albert Pike is having a fit, right? So he wrote a, book, a, a text called um, the, um, what was this, uh, the, 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 the damn thing he wrote? Um, the, uh, basically he wrote, he wrote a treatise against the ancient and primitive right. Okay. To put it, uh, but he, it was, um, what was it called, uh, the, uh, I can't even remember the name of it, but he wrote a treatise in 1865 that basically made it look like, um, it was a very negative thing, okay? So, so the, the ancient and primitive, right, um, uh, let's go back a little bit, okay? Very confusing history. Late 1700s, <laughs> early 1800s, right of Memphis is found about 1815. Arab Garrett, Saban, Disciple de Memphis, the Disciples of Memphis by Samuel Oni, right? Uh, and then Garibald uh, Mathieu Marconi de Negra uh, takes over it. Then his son, Jacques Etienne Marconi de Negra, takes over, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then the right of Memphis becomes the right of Memphis. Uh, 
in ancient primitive writing methods goes from 90 to 92 to 95 degrees. And then by the end of the 19th century, it's expanded to 97 degrees by John Yarker in 1910. Okay? And, and at that point, John Yarker was the grand hierophant of both rights, both the rights of Memphis okay. and his right. Okay? Now, for a time, the, the right of Memphis was, re, re, like I said, it was reduced to 33 degrees, as I mentioned. Remember that I mentioned it? Mm-hmm. So basically, it, to, to, to make it simple, it essentially took the, uh, the, the degrees that were practiced from the 4th to the 33rd degree and slammed them from the 4th to the 20th place. And then from the 34th to the 95th degree, the most important ones that were practiced, it slammed them from 21st to 33rd. Okay, so that's basically what the Grand Orient, the Grand Orient Egyptian, the Grand or- the Grand Egyptian Order of the Grand Orient of France is called the Grand Ultra Egyptian. Okay, these this is the way they do it. They do it a they do a 33 degree right, but it's basically like the first 20 are the degrees of the ancient except the Scottish right, and then the upper 30 13 are from the 34th to the 95th degree. Okay, then in 1881. That's when the two rites were fused into one. The ancient primitive of Memphis Mithraim. And this is fused by Giuseppe Garibaldi, mm-hmm. okay, the great general and leader of, of Italy. Okay, So it becomes a unified rite. It starts off with 95 degrees, then, it's, and then John Yarker expands it to 97 degrees, right? Uh-huh. Um, and then uh, later on, between 1934 and 1951, Fudosi expands it to 99 degrees. Many of the traditional lineages keep it at 97 degrees, okay? It begins to spread throughout Europe and through the, and, and through the world. Now, um, John Yarker became its international grandmaster in 1902 EV of the mm-hmm. of Garris, and he became its grand hierophant in 1910. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, so Albert Pike... In 1865, as I mentioned, he made a very negative text regarding the ancient and primitive right. And uh, from that point on, eventually, you know, it's kind of looked on with a negative view mm-hmm. in regular formation. Okay? Now, yeah, it is. I, I've read somewhere that Albert Pike was a part of the primitive rights at one time. Yeah, the ancient primitive right, he may have. I, I don't know, man. He, he definitely didn't want power taken away from his right. So what, what happened was John York gave Theodore Rose, um, along with Franz Hartzman and, and Henry Klein, a charter. And this was given on September 24th of 1902 of the Common Era. Okay, and this was a charter to run the 33 degrees, according to the Scottish Rite of Cerno, or the ancient accepted Scottish Rite, and a sovereign sanctuary of the Rite of Memphis and Mizraim for the rights of 34 to 95, basically, Mm -hmm. okay? Now, this right there explains to us why when we see the old charters of Ordo Templi Orientis, right, they have this seal of the ancient accepted Scottish right, the double-headed eagle, 33 degrees and all this and that, and then inside the double-headed eagle in the center, there's a much smaller seal that's the nef, that's the the triangle over the flying egg and uh, ancient and primitive right of Memphis Mizraim in German, but you could tell Ritus, Memphis Mizraim, you know, you're like, okay, the right of Memphis and Mizraim, right? And it's right in the middle because the original charter was basically this. First 33 degrees, ancient accepted Scottish right, 34th to 95th, Memphis and Mizraim. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what explains. Now, now Theodore Royce had a legitimate charter. He was a legitimate initiate. Theodore Royce also had the lineage of the Bavarian Illuminati. Okay? That's another thing. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So anyway, so Theodore Royce, okay, um, yeah, he, he had, he revived the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati in 1880 of the Common Era. He was, it's the Grand Master of the, um, the revived Order of the Illuminati. Okay? And he wanted to incorporate its goals of worldwide luminism into Ordo Templi Orientis. Okay, so this is one of the lineages that we take. There's a reason why my order is called the International Order of Kinetic Gnosis and Illuminism. Because we take both lineages. We take both the ancient primitive right of Memphis Mizraim lineage and we take the lineage from the Illuminati. Okay, but uh, we don't talk about that much. <laughs> because, 
because people get the wrong idea. You know? Right. They so look, Illuminati, I, you I, know, I, I, I'm going to cut you short just for a second. So we've been on here for yeah. about an hour and thirty-four minutes. I know we've been all over oh, okay. the all over the book, and then we came back a little bit. And yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap, and wrap it up. Okay, so so basically, let me finish up with my lineage, and then we can, uh, you know. So from this point on, the lineage was passed on to Gerard Anaclay Dante Ancos. Okay, that was his name was Papu. That was his nickname, P A P U S on June 24th of 1908 of the Common Era. This was at a conference in Paris set up by Encaz, and that was with the knowledge of John Erker. It was, it was a conference with Theodore Royce, and he was formally given the 10th degree of the Ordo Templi Orientis, and that was the highest degree in the order, because Ordo Templi Orientis basically just collapses these degrees into 10 essential degrees, okay? Um, Royce was consecrated as a bishop in the Gnosis by Encaz, on cause, in turn, was given all the rituals, and they basically cross-initiated each other. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of this cross-initiation that goes on in the ancient Primorite Memphis Mitzrayim, which, for whatever reason, makes APR and, and Masons feel awkward. They don't like to talk about these cross-initiation uh, gatherings that took place, but they did. So, so they cross-initiated each other. So, uh, on cause, basically consecrates them as a legitimate bishop with a lineage now going all the way back to Peter, the apostle. And um, Theodore Royce basically initiates him in all these high degrees uh, of, a, uh, of a collapsed ancient primitive Memphis Mizraim. Okay? And then from that point on, in 1910, okay, Papu passed the lineages of both the Gnosis, including the consecration as a bishop, and the ancient primitive rite of Memphis Mizraim, he passes it to Lucien Francois Jean Maine to expand the esoteric and magical aspect, especially within the ancient primitive rite of Memphis Mizraim, mm -hmm. in a collapsed form, especially known as the Ordo Templi Orientis, which was it, it's become known as the Ordo Templi Orientis Antiqua, or the Franco Haitian OTO. That, that's to differentiate that from the Ordo Templi Orientis of Aleister Crowley. Okay, so Jean, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Lucien Francois Jean Main is given the lineages of the ancient primitive rite of Memphis Mizraim. He's also consecrated as bishop, and that is passed on to his son, Hector Francois Jean Main. And Hector Francois Jean Main then passes that on to Michael Paul Bertio. And Michael Paul Bertio, as we know, is a very big initiate in the Western mysteries, especially in the mysteries of voodoo or voodoo gnosis, right? So Michael Paul Bertio was then, had all these lineages passed to him in 1970 for the common era. And then between the 10th of April and the 17th of April of 1973, he happened to take place with the Synod Gnostic bishops that were also representing 15 other esoteric organizations, including lineages of the ancient Primorite Memphis Mizraim, mm. and they all cross-initiated one another in the highest levels. So, at that point, Michael Paul Bertio definitely had the highest lineage, okay, in the ancient Primorite of Memphis Mizraim, as well as having the lineage of the Gnosis. And from that point on, Michael Paul Bertio then consecrated and re-consecrated Alan Henry Greenfield, my consecrator, in in on September twenty first, nineteen eighty six of the Common Era, and December fourth of nineteen ninety three of the Common Era, and along with the decrees of the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim, and he gives him a formal formal charter on eight, October fifteenth of nineteen ninety two of the Common Era. Okay, and um, at, at, uh, excuse me, uh, nineteen ninety three. Now, at that point on, it, it, he gave him the, the it, no, 1992, excuse me, October 15, 1992, he gives him those, the, the, that charter. Now, um, from that point on, uh, where I come into the picture, I was entered, passed, and raised at Alexandria Washington Lodge number 22 in the year 1993 of the Common Era, and then I had the 4th to the 32nd degrees 
at the Alexandria, uh, uh, Alexandria, Virginia Scottish Rite Temple on West Bradford in spring 1993 of the Common Era. From that point on, I, I moved away from regular Freemasonry and I practiced a lot of magic, a lot of ceremonial magic, a lot of mysticism. And um, after the mysticism and magic, I was a part of, of the, the various, you know, three different orders of Sufism for many years. And then I went back to more mystical Kabbalistic practices, but always in a right hand pathway. And I, I got back in touch with Ta- Alan Greenfield and with the Progressive Stream and Eventually, uh, we got to see each other on September 17th of 2016 of the Common Era. Mm. I was uh, initiated, consecrated, and recognized as a grand conservator of the right, 33rd degree, 66th, 90th, 95th degree, and I was given the full spectrum of the plant short energetic initiations of Rudolph Gnosis, uh, which go from you know, they cover the 97 degrees of the traditional ancient from the right of Memphis was rain. And uh, I was given a charter as the founder and the head of the Roman numeral 13, the 13th degree of OIU, which is our lineage of the Illuminati. And um, from that time, it's been incorporated. The OIU has been incorporated as an inner order within the... Uh, International Order of Gnosis and Illuminism. Mm. And then on April 15th of 2017, EB, I already had clearance from Alan, verbal clearance from Alan, actually. Then on April 15th, I, I told him I want to establish an order. And, and I he basically knew what was going on. So when I established that, I basically got like a, a retroactive um, chartering. Because I said, look, I've established it April 15, 2017. Can you charter? He said, absolutely. He gave me a charter for it. So from that point on, it's been chartered April 15, 2017 of the Common Era as Sovereign Grand Master and Grand Hierophant of the International Order of Kinetic Gnosis and Illuminism. So, and, uh, so I'm, I'm going to go back and say, one brother said he's lost in the conversation. I want to bring him up to par. The conversation well, well, that we're having right now is in regards to the lineage of Brother um, uh, Manuel in the in the organization for which he's a part of. So yeah, it may be talking over some of some of the brothers that are on here. It may be talking over your head, and some of you may be getting it, some of you may not. But it's interesting only because of the tie of the ancient primitive rites and how that plays into Freemasonry and how he got to be where his where he's at on his journey from what we would what we would call mainstream Grand Lodge and now here he is in in the definitely the esoteric and uh part of Freemasonry and the primitive right side of Freemasonry. So this is that type of conversation we're having tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and allow him to wrap it up. So we've been on here for about 142 and uh we're gonna go ahead and close out but I, he's gonna come back on he's gonna be like a regular guest for 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 a little while because he's brought us some very interesting points and i know people want to stay on topic and i apologize because we was all over the map for a minute so i'm gonna go ahead and let him wrap it up real quick and and we're gonna close out tonight's show i know and i was trying to keep it on point on the on the history of it go into that but we went all over the place um, to wrap it up, my order, okay, we are, the way we're thinking of doing things from this point on with this whole coronavirus thing and everything going on, obviously we can't really do gatherings and um, do actual major initiations for a time. So what I've been thinking of doing because of what's going on, now in, in most traditional jurisdictions, a grandmaster can name somebody Master Mason right, on the spot, especially when it comes to founding a lodge. They can name, like, 10, 12 Master Masons, yes. you know, hey, boom, to establish a lodge. So what I think would be even more legitimate than that would be to take them through um, a curriculum of learning. So we're developing a curriculum of learning right now, and we're going to develop a self-initiation course, mm-hmm. a self-initiation. So there's going to be rituals of self-initiation for the Entered Apprentice degree, for the Fellow Craft degree, and for the Master Mason degree. This is not going to replace the traditional degrees. However, 
it is going to give you an honorary Master Mason certificate so that you can actually run a triangular lodge until you can come forward and get the actual degrees and then move forward so you can then move along the rest of the structure. Now, the rest of the structure um, in person would work like this. The way with we work it, we have it in like six stages, essentially, okay, the way that we work it. So your first stage is you get your symbolic degrees, enter apprentice, fellow craft, master mason, all in one weekend, and your ecclesiastical degrees which are subdeacon, deacon, priest, or subdeaconess, deaconess, priestess, if it's a woman, right? Because we initiate men and women. And that's your first stage. At that point, you have to write a number of different architectures on all the things you've learned from those three degrees, different, um, you know, lessons that you need to inculcate and write essays on, which we call architectures. That's the first stage. Your second stage. <laughs> he said, the, now I'm, I'm going to help him out a little bit. So what's going on here is that the, 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 the brother, he said I'm looping or something. What, what, is, what is actually taking place as we begin to wrap up the show. I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Brother Manuel. So I'm just reading some of the text because I want to make sure brothers don't get lost in the conversation. What he's explaining to you is, the, is an esoteric initiation, if I'm not mistaken. Um... As one begins to begins that journey, not what we see in tomorrow in today's modern initiation in a in a in a apprentice fellow craft master mason. We he's actually talking about an esoteric initiation. If I'm wrong, okay, correct yeah, me. Okay. Okay, so he's coming in really late to the conversation. Let me explain it real, real quick. Okay. So the ritual of the York Rite, which is the quote unquote blue lodge. For the enter apprentice fellow craft master mason, it's totally different from the ritual from the modern French rite. It's totally different from the ancient accepted Scottish rite. It's totally different from the ancient primitive rite. Each and every rite of Freemasonry has its own version of the first three degrees. Okay, I, I posted on the page also a page from Chris Hodap, even Chris Hodap, the, the the that happy Sasquatch, and I can't really i don't really like him too much because he's always making it out to be like oh regular freemasonry is great but anyway so even chris hodap's page he had to admit that there are three degrees of the ancient except the scottish right and even he had to grit, uh, admit or read his own writings there where he says that most american masons don't even know that they exist it's on there okay so every single right of freemasonry and there are like at least two or three dozen rites of Freemasonry. Every single rite has its own version of the entered apprentice degree, the fellow craft, also known as the companion degree, and the master mason degree. And each ritual of entered apprentice from one rite to the other is completely different. The only things that have in common are the password, signs, tokens. Okay, but gotcha. In the esoteric degrees, in the esoteric degrees, they are completely different. In the esoteric degrees, like the ancient accepted Scottish rite and the ancient primitive rite of Memphis Mizraim, you have the three steps mm -hmm. that are the points between the two columns. Why? Because they are symbolized on the tree of life. This is Kabbalah, and you are forming the middle pillar. Okay, got it, got it. So, you don't do the steps of the York Rite, and you don't have master ceremonies. You don't have a person who takes the part of thought of Tehuti to guide you on your journey of initiation. You don't have that. And with the Interapprentice degree, you don't go through the alchemical elements in the York Rite. You don't do any. You do a single journey, a uh, uh, happy ring around the rosy, and, and you're done. In, in the fellow craft degree, the companion degree, you don't do esoteric philosophy. You do a very, very short form of it. And in the Master Masons degree, you don't do, you don't, you don't look at Osiris. Not even mentioned. It's just this, this fake Hirama Biff that never existed. I'll say it again. Hirama Biff never existed. Okay? It's a fake figure put there. Because white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, OK, 
cannot deal with the Osirian initiation. Well, with that being said, <laughs> with that being said, I, I really need to go ahead and wrap it up. So if, if you can, I really need to go ahead and wrap it up. Okay. So let's do the six stages, what I was trying to do. This brother had to take me back, so I had to explain <laughs> it for the brother. But I've got six six levels. We've got six levels of initiation. First, we do the symbolic degrees and the ecclesiastical degrees. Okay? I'm not going to go over that again. From that point on, we do the esoteric degrees of the order. The second stage is when somebody gets all of the work done for those symbolic degrees, then they're entitled to receive the esoteric degrees. The esoteric degrees are the Sangreal Sodality uh, initiations and the Templar Order initiations and the support for philosophers. That's the third stage. The fourth stage, okay, is the um, the 33rd degree of the ancient Android Memphis, which is pretty much the same degree as the 33rd degree of the ancient accepted Scottish Rite degree, except it's a little bit more esoteric. That's a little bit more stuff to it, but it's very similar to it, like 95% the same, okay, with a little bit of more stuff on top. From that point on, that's the one, two, three, four. The fifth stage from that point is the uh, what we call the egregore initiations. The egregore initiations for us are the CBCS, Martinist, LU Cohen, and um, OKR plus C initiations. These are the initiations to the inner original orders that are normally kept as the inner orders of the ancient Paranormal of Memphis Mizraim. In my humble opinion, they're way too cluttered with a lot of extra crap. So we draw the egregore, the blessing from the orders to be able to carry forth the teachings from these initiations. And then we extract the inner teachings and we discuss them in our meetings in the Templar order. And then we work their magic, the inner magic, in the Sangreal Sodali meetings. Okay. okay. And then from that point on, our last stage is the people who are initiated from 34th degree to the 95th degree. And that means, first of all, being consecrated as a Gnostic bishop. And from that point on, being given the 97 points of the plant shod, which are the energetic empowerments of the Vudan Gnosis. And then being initiated formally, giving the lectures from the 34th degree to the 65th degree, and then at 66th degree, doing that initiation. And then from there on, getting the lectures from the 67th degree to the 86th degree, and then from the 87th, 88th, 89th, and 90th degree, working the initiations for the Rite of Mizraim of Naples, okay, and getting those four degrees, and then 91st, 92nd, 93rd, 94th, the lectures again, 95th degree actually being worked, and you're a 95th degree member. 96th degree essentially is basically being named as the National Grand Hierophant and National, you know, Mm -hmm. Grand Master, uh, or as a member of the International Council. And then 97th degree is Grand Hierophant of an Order. Now, as I said, Fudosi, right, the gatherings from 1934 to 1951, they decided to expand the degrees to 99 degrees. Some rights follow the 99 degree structure, some rights, uh, some, excuse me, excuse me, some orders follow the 97 degree structure of the ancient Prime right of Memphis frame, and some orders follow the 99 degree structure. It's whatever, man. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that one is right and the other is wrong. Um, we do it with the 97 degree structure. Some people do it with the 99 degree structure. Okay. You know, and, and, and it is what it is, you know. All right. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, really, there was a lot of information. I'm quite sure um, people have gotten they got a they got a lot a, a lot of earful of information. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna log it off. But I got some more questions for you. We're gonna probably do that on another day, another time. But um, I certainly appreciate you coming on again. And I didn't mean to take you off subject, you know, and and go through these different these different doors. But you know. I was in the chat room kind of looking at what people was putting up. 
So once again, I want to thank you for your time, and I really appreciate you coming on and definitely enlightening. Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity, brother. Listen, one thing I wanted to say is like the next, if you want to have me on again next week, and if you want, if people want to talk about one thing that I was talking about, the Tony about that I thought would make a great show, and I'm going to let all of you guys decide out there, all you guys, guys and gals, ladies and gentlemen out there, decide because I want to discuss. The um, the essentials of the difference in symbolism between the York Rite first three degrees and Sir Francis Felgraf Master Mason and the ancient accepted Scottish Rite first three degrees and the ancient Primitive Rite Memphis Mizraim first three degrees and the Rite of Cagliostro the original Egyptian Rite first three degrees. So a comparative analysis between those four rites in the first three foundational degrees. I don't know how you feel about that. But if you'd like to do that, just let us know, man. You know, because that was one idea that I had. But um, if you want to write to me, mm -hmm. you can write to me, at, and I will post it on the bottom, kinetic.gnosis.and.illuminism at gmail.com. And either I will answer or one of my officers will answer. Brother Daniel Rivera, most likely who's right now in charge of that. He's acting grant secretary right now. So he will most likely answer, or I will if I'm a little, if I'm not too busy, but one of us will answer and we'll help you out with whatever questions you have. We'll take your, your forms. You know, if you want to write to us, ask us how you can be initiated, we'll send you an application form. The application form is free. You don't have to pay anything for it. From that point on, the self-initiation rituals, what we're going to do is we're going to get very affordable. All you have to do is, like, send in for the regalia, and, um, you know, we'll send it. And, and the, the rituals, the rites, the, the, the initiation degrees are at half price. And then all you do is when you're done with that and you've already been initiated to master, as Master Mason, we're going to actually establish virtual lodges online. We're going to establish a virtual lodge in English, another one in Spanish, and another one in Portuguese. The one in English is going to be run by me. The one in Spanish is going to be run by our National Grand Hierophant of Mexico, um, Jesus Leo Momont. And then the one in Portuguese is going to be run by a brother in Sao Paulo, uh, Vinicius Rosa. So we're going to have three virtual lodges that are going to be run. And um, that way, people that are, have self-initiated themselves. And we're going we're gonna to talk about all this. If anybody wants to email me, kinetic.gnosis.and.illuminism at gmail.com, I will put the link down below. And I will put the link also to our website down below. So in case you lose the email, you can always just go to the website and scroll down to the bottom and just punch in all the information and it'll come through to our website. All right, uh, I, excuse me, to our email. Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. And to everybody, whatever you do, keep your light on and stay out the bushes. We're out. Peace and thank you. That's nice, right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Ah, if I can log off, don't be laughing at me over there, man. I'm, there you go.